Okay. This week is special. It's a bonus episode of the Paul Pod for Curtain Call 2. And we have Uh-oh. a special guest Uh-oh. broadcasting live from Detroit. Mm-hmm. You've got so many names. I don't know which one to start with. I know. I always do that to y'all. Let's start with <laughs> Mr. Porter. Yeah. <laughs> that works. Denine Porter. Yeah. Con artist. Yep. There's more. Yeah, Nani Cakes every once in a while. Nani, th- those are the three main main names. Yeah. Broadcasting live from Detroit for a special bonus edition of the Paul Pod. Welcome to the show. I am honored to be yes, here. Yes, it's wonderful to have you. And as you know, we've been going through Marshall's, basically his career, but focusing on sort of post- Encore days and the albums leading up to the Curtain Call 2 Greatest Hits compilation. And you, my friend, play a big part in a lot of that material. So we didn't want to wrap this up without having talked to you. Now, I know that most of this conversation is going to be about you and your relationship with Marshall, Mm -hmm. but there's some stuff I want to get out of the way about you because it's important to the conversation. Let's do it. Okay. So in doing my research, even though I've known you for quite some time, yeah. I learned something that I was not aware of. What's that? You were born in North Carolina. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not an original. You're not a native born yeah. Detroiter. <laughs> nope. Tell me about that. Cause I didn't know how'd that happen. My mom is from North Carolina. My dad was born in Detroit. I was born in North Carolina and I was like there for Man, I can't even tell you. Because, like, I would come here to go to school, obviously, go back back to North Carolina. Right. Probably. Well, what I saw is, you know, Wikipedia, which, you know, is always 100 percent right. Just kidding. (laughs) It's just kidding. And it said that you lived there until you were about 10. But then Mm -hmm. at some point you had moved also to Mississippi. Well, Mississippi was the summers. So I just Ah, did. Okay. We didn't have a house. So it was like a. I was splitting the time in between North Carolina and Mississippi for a long time. Then got we it. finally got a house. Then we moved. Then so I moved you would, back. <laughs> you would go and visit family in the summer in Mississippi and then come back to North Carolina. But anyway, you end up in Detroit some point mm-hmm. around 10 years old. And then, you know, there's a there's a gap in time by, by the time you meet Marshall, obviously. Yeah. So tell me about a little bit about your sort of musical background in that time. What What got you enthralled with hip hop and started working as a producer and artist. What was it? Bonita Apple Bum. So there's you can pinpoint this to one specific song. Yeah, for me it was that because even with NWA and BC Boys and I ended up going back and yep. discovering that stuff. It was Bonita Apple Bum. I was like, oh that's it. It's, and I can't remember what year that was. When I met him, I honestly was only doing beats probably three months. <laughs> right. And so, so Benita Applebaum, I, 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 without looking it up, just based on my recollection, mm-hmm. I'm going to guess is about 90 or 91. Mm-hmm. Sound about yeah. right? Yep. Okay. So that's a very specific. What about that song in particular? Was it the production, the rapping, just the whole vibe? Like, what, what was it? It felt like, it felt like, obviously, I was living in an aggressive environment. In Detroit. Yeah. Right. So with it being that, it was the thing that felt completely different. Mm-hmm. And it was like non, it was, it, it felt like it was refreshing, but it was also like. Safe? It felt more like me. Right. You know, it was like a soulful, I come from a soulful background. My dad is a singer. He's, a, and, and him and my grandfather, that's how he met my mother. My grandfather's one of the original five blind boys of Alabama. Well, that is pretty amazing. And Five Blind Boys of Alabama, is, is that blues or, or gospel? That's, that's gospel. 
Gospel. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. So and that being my background, that was like, it just felt right. Sure. You know? And it makes total like, sense. That was it. So it was more of a vibey thing. It was more of a soulful thing. Mm-hmm. And you connected with it more. And the light may have gone off in your head and you said, oh, there's hip hop like this. And I yeah. can relate to this. Mm-hmm. And maybe I can even make this. Yeah, because I couldn't listen to, I got in trouble for listening to NWA. and We all did. Yeah, right? Yeah. I got in trouble for it. And I was like, I could listen to this. It's not, you know, I'm not going to get in trouble for this. But it felt like I could, you know. Even though Benita Applebaum you know? was talking about a girl with, in her butt. Exactly. But just in code words. So if, like, if Completed. your parents weren't paying attention, they wouldn't really know. If they really paid attention and they really knew what time it was. They didn't know what Jimmy they was. They didn't know what I was doing. Or Jimmy Hats were. <laughs> Jim Hats fell. Or any of that, right? <laughs> they didn't know what that was, bro. Right. So, so you get inspired by Benita Applebaum, and what do you start doing first? Are you writing as a as a rapper or singer or producer or all of the above or what? Well, I had already been. My dad would line us up and make us sing. Like he would he line would you up. Singing. Yeah, we, but my, me, my brother, and my sister. Okay, he would line us up, and we, everybody had they they had they tone, and they had they. You got to stay in your lane. Don't get out of that. So, were you like harmonizing? <laughs> yep. Wow. Uh huh. So I was already doing that, but it wasn't like I was doing it in front of people. I was doing it at home. And he just wanted you to do it because he wanted you to have that skill? No, nah, it was just like, he was just messing around. Like, for fun? Man, <laughs> yeah, it was for fun. Okay. Yeah, and then All I right. would watch them in their shows at church and stuff, and I was like, man, this is actually cool, but I don't know if I could do that. Because, you right. know, just being shy. So but you sing you sing a lot in a falsetto. And is, is, is that what you were doing back then as well? No. Uh, okay. I didn't discover that until... I kind of discovered that through Rich and M, my friend Rich and and, and Marshall. They okay. kind of like would always be like, "Yo, you can sing, you should do it." And yeah. I was just always well, they messing were right. around. And you're because your dad taught you how. So, yeah. <laughs> but I was yeah. like trying to hide all that. So, right. Yeah. So, but, yeah. so your dad's teaching you how to sing. You're you're sort of working at developing your chops in that regard. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, you start rapping. I started rapping first. Okay. And when it, when it came to that, it was it was also filling and it was a lot of pockets. I was really into pockets. I wasn't really into the punchlines. It was the pockets. And for those that don't know, which is probably a lot of people listening, when you say pockets, what do you mean? Like riding the beat. Like how you so fit into the beat. falling yeah. into areas in within the rhythm between the snare hi-hat and the kick drum mm-hmm. in different ways. Yeah. Those Turn are the different pockets, right? Yep. Timing. Timing. Right. Yep. Where you land at with the syllable, where you land at, where it's going right. to fall. Yep. Where the word you rhyme at lands, whether it's on a snare or at the end or the middle, and then where you start the next bar, right? Yeah. Or, all of that. Yeah, it's all these little tricks of trade that you kind of learn, but that's the, right. that's the gist of it. Got you. Yeah, I mean, there's a million ways to do it, right? That's why, you know, that's what, that's what keeps it interesting. Keep it interesting. Pockets are Pockets are more important sometimes because... Some people aren't as like like they're not they're not as I won't say as good. They're not as technical as a Marshall or a Royce or you know. Yeah. So it's sometimes you like them because of you know how they how they ride the beat. Right, and and you might not even know as a listener unless you're really paying close attention what they're doing. No, right? no. Because sometimes if you listen to a guy like. You know, since we're talking about him, this is his his podcast, essentially. Since you're talk, talking about a guy like Marshall, mm-hmm. he's often even riding like a hi-hat. Yeah. He'll find the the little nuances in a beat, and he'll... he'll he started off just trying to land on certain snares, and be like, the other snare, and then I would notice, like, he would skip sometimes, and then it would be rhyming. It was really weird, but his main right. thing is, like, he'll become... As he got more and more and more and more technical and more advanced, yeah, it's like a hi hat and it's going crazy. <laughs> sure, but it's all very yeah. deliberate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Like th- it's not by accident. He locks that's why into it's good to make beats without a lot of hi hats for him. I see. Okay, I, that's why I like giving him more not crazy hi hats because because he locks be into that. it and becomes rigid yeah. sometimes. Yeah, it's just that I'm super into because what people don't realize about him is that just as much as he is an incredible writer. His pockets are like he's making these rhythms up when he's going. And it's like that was the one thing that I gravitated towards 
was how he chose what instrument he chose to become. So right. knowing drums and knowing how drums work, I'd be like, you know what? Let me scale it down so that he can, I can see what he's going to do. And I'm always excited about where he's going to choose. Right. You know? All right. So, so we're going to get more into that, obviously, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Paul pod with Mr. Porter. Uh, hi. So we're getting into the area where you guys cross paths, Mm -hmm. right? And this is still before my time and knowing you guys Mm -hmm. by a few years, but from, from what I know, you guys met through a gentleman named IQ. IQ. Yeah. Right, IQ. Yes. So, how did that happen? Well, just to go back even a little bit before that, I knew of him. I just didn't go to school because I got shot at fourteen. I got okay. shot at fourteen, and I met him about four or five years later. So, so you got shot, and then you stopped going to school. Yeah, I was like, we eighth grade. That was it. After eighth grade, I went to ninth grade. I was moving back to North Carolina. We were supposed to move back. Yeah. I went there for like half a semester. And my man, my mom was like, we going back. And I was like, no, let's not go back. And yeah, I got well, shot. <laughs> so you got shot and, and yep. obviously survived. I think you, I, I know you might've got hit in the keister. <laughs> what's, what's that? What you mean? The keister? The, the ass. No, 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 no. In your no, arm? I got shot. No, I got shot in my left leg. On your leg. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why, that's oh, where your deer upper leg, leg came from. Yeah, that deer leg. The Remember deer, deer leg. leg. All right, so not <laughs> not far from the keister. Yeah. Okay. No, so I got shot in my left leg. It was, it was across the main artery with a vein. I ended up flatlining three times in the surgery. I was depressed for two years, and I was trying to figure things out. But I had met him. I knew IQ. Right. Because at this time, remember, I was rapping, but mm-hmm. I wasn't taking it serious. Met IQ, and Q really understood my level of talent that I didn't understand. And he was like, "You got to give beats to people." And I was like, "Oh man, it's you know." I'm wait, just wait, 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 wait. Let's 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 address that for a second. Mm-hmm. He understood your level of talent, which you didn't understand. Does I that didn't mean understand. you didn't believe in what you were doing, or you didn't know what you were capable of, or both? I didn't know if that was good or not. I you just didn't, okay. I just loved the loved the, the the aspect of making music. Yeah, like that's understandable. Doing, I mean, you don't yeah. really have an audience yet, and it's just yeah. you sort of doodling around in your bedroom or cheap studios yeah. or whatever, and you don't really have that much feedback, so how do you know how good you are? You right? don't know, right? Right. And Q was like, yo, you tripping. And then he he told M about me, and M lived around the corner, and I didn't know that. Right. So how close are we talking? We're talking literally like... 175 steps. <laughs> like, so he was on Dresden already? Yeah, he was he was he had moved from Dresden by this time, but he lived he had just moved. I don't I, I want to say where he was around the corner on Dresden and I walked by that school by his house Paul almost every day and didn't even know it when I was So you you're, you're to walking school. to school. Mm-hmm. Right past Marshall's house on Dresden. Yep. Didn't know him. Didn't know him. I mean, can you, can you just fathom that for a second? You know, it's even crazier. There's a yeah. guy that stayed on his street that lived across the street, and me and him was best friends. This white guy named Michael Carafelli. <laughs> so another like, white guy on Dresden in Detroit. Guy on Dresden. Dresden was the white people's street, I think. But you're 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 friends with the guy across the street. <laughs> I'm a, I'm friends with the you guy. Know, across you're not the friends street. with Eminem. No, don't even. You're know walking him. past his house, <laughs> completely hanging out with Michael Carafelli, whatever his name is. <laughs> And Michael you don't know Eminem something. yet, but he's no, there. No, and 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 now this is before high school, and that's why I had heard about him because Proof brought him to Osborne, and he murdered everybody up there. Okay, <laughs> all right, yeah. now we're getting somewhere. All right, yeah. So you're walking to school every day, past Marshall's house, going mm-hmm. to Osborne. I'm going to Pulaski. Okay, you're going to Pulaski, but Proof was at Osborne. Yeah, they were already. And, and Marshall ahead of me. wasn't at either of those schools. No. Right? No. And Proof bought him up He there. was at Lincoln? He was at yeah, Lincoln, at, Lincoln at this time. Well, he wasn't there. He was supposed to be at Lincoln. Right. He was supposed to be at Lincoln <laughs> right. for his third try at ninth grade or whatever it was. Yeah. All right. So they were, they were ahead of me, so that's why. They were a year or two older than you, right? Yeah, yep. yep. So Marshall's hanging out with Proof, mm-hmm. and he's going... He's being invited by Proof to go to Osborne, where Proof went to high school, mm. so that he could rap in the lunchroom. 
and right? Montrone. That was where it was going down. And he would set Marshall up and and sort of use him in sort of a white man can't jump kind of way, right? Yeah, like pretty much. I bet you whatever you can't beat the white boy. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> if they only knew, they had no idea. So and, and he proof, was, he was tearing proof is cleaning apart. up. He's taking everybody's money. Marshall's battling. Cats left and right. I don't even know if he was doing it even for money. He was just doing it because you know how crazy Proof was? He would just do stuff like just to... Just to fuck with people. Just to mess with people, yeah. Yeah, Ah, I got you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that was enough for him. That's it, yeah. So so you get invited by who? To... To Osborne to see all this shenanigans. No, I was actually supposed to be there. Okay. I was supposed to be going there by the time... He had been doing this for a little bit, but... Let's say when I graduated from eighth grade, what grade was they? Uh, maybe well, they should they have been, been probably in ninth or tenth. Yeah, they was in tenth, tenth or yeah, might might have been tenth or eleventh. But by the time I was going there, I went for like a month. This was before I got shot, mind you. So uh-huh. I knew of him, but I was friends with Proof because Proof lived in the hood. He lived in, um, on on Hoover. I stayed on Row. I stayed on Death Row. He stayed on Hoover, and Vaughn stayed on Runyon. Making so it sound like L.A. Man, listen, it was L.A. before L.A. <laughs> it was like, like I mean, you know how bad it was, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so, uh, I, I, of course. So he he they stayed there, and I heard he had came up to Osborne, and I was like, "What do you mean it's a white boy? What are you talking about?" But I mind you, Paul, I didn't remember. I couldn't even. I didn't even recall that because it was you know I got shot and my kind of things like that. So right. by the time IQ tells him about me, I'm doing beats for three months because at this point. I discovered JD, who people know as Dilla. Right. And um, I didn't know Q-Tip. I knew I found out Q-Tip made beats. And I was like, you can make beats and rap? And then I saw Proof make beats and rap. And remember, IQ made beats. Okay. And so... So wait, he, so wait, where, where in this equation and in what circumstances do you actually meet Marshall under? He tells M about me, and M shows up at my door. <laughs> IQ tells tells Marshall about you. Yep, and he shows he, up. He finds out that you live around the corner from him, mm-hmm. and he comes <laughs> over to your house. He comes over to the house, knocks on the side door. And says Come what? On. Q told me about you, blah, 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 blah. I think my we might have talked on the phone. Maybe we talked on the phone, but Q hooked us up. I can't okay. remember how exactly, but I know when he came to the house, my mom was like, you better not be selling no drugs. Oh, <laughs> <was> man. Because like, <laughs> in oh, our hood, man. obviously, where we at, like, right down the street from my block is the bad block. So M's block and my block was like, you know, it was it was almost like a. I had to cross one street. We had one street in between us. Right. But that next block over from me, bro, it was like the Carter. <laughs> so where so, you were living was... Livable, residential, okay. Yeah, Marshall's right block to, was livable, yeah. residential, okay. Yeah. Still yeah. smack in the middle of the hood. Sma- but there was a street in between that was really bad. Yeah, like it was New Jack City. Block. It was New Jack City. The Which block street? Next up for me. It, that was on Row. Row was, was New block. Jack City. Okay. You know how it is. Like when you know how it is there. It's like you're you got that long street that go from eight mile to seven mile, but there's the blocks. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So the next block up terrible and so that's why my mom thought what's going on so what's the main street in between seven and eight mile that's like seven and a half mile state fair okay right yeah because m was so you guys were on the south side of state fair right no we were on the north side of state fair closer to eight mile closer to eight mile okay m was literally right at state fair his block and state fair is right there Got it. All I'm right. on I, two blocks. I know. From that. I know the geography a little bit. I was on yeah. 13 mile, but I, I know the geography a little bit. <laughs> you, you was, you was out the way in the good space. I was like, all right, yeah. you have, you, that's good. We didn't have, we didn't have New Jack City. We had no. uh, Burger King. You. Meet Marshall either on the phone or in person. He says, "Yo, IQ told me we should get up." Yeah, because he heard you made beats. Yep, and and he wanted beats. He wanted beats because he didn't have beats at this time. Right, and I was like, "Okay, cool." So the first thing I played him was Backstabber. 
But wait a second. How did you know that he could rap? You just took his word for it? Nah, he played me Backstabber the original. Okay. And when I heard that, he was like, yo, I want to do another version to this. I need another version of this song. Okay, yeah. got you. So you heard that and you were like, okay, he can rap. Mm -hmm. Did you think he was great or okay or good or? So here's where, here's where creatively I got him. Okay. We both big Tretch fans. Yes. And I said, yo, if you slow down a little bit, <laughs> people would be able to understand you. Yeah, I got in trouble for that on, on the last podcast. What, 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 what? <laughs> apparently, apparently there's one one point where I told him to let off the gas a little bit. And he told mm -hmm. he the way he related to Rick made it sound different. And okay. Rick was like, is he crazy? <laughs> he was like, what are you saying? Like, calm it down. Don't be so good. I think he meant like, don't don't push yourself so hard. Like, let off the gas. And I was just no, saying, yeah. literally, don't go so fast with your. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with, yeah. Make the words so dense. And, and that's, that's kind of what you're saying. That's what I was telling. It was like, right. yo, if you slow down and people actually get, because I understood what he was saying, because li I'm listening to it like I listen to Tretch. And I was like, yo, if we kind of slow this down and we did Backstabber. And when he did it, his delivery, I mean, I was like, yo, this is not normal. Right. And he was seriously evolving at this point into not even what he became and the world knows him as, but into no. the... Eminem of the Infinite period. Yes. Right? This was the first song before we did Infinite, yep. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which ended up... Did it end up on Infinite? No, we didn't put it on Infinite, I don't think. But Backstabber? That was the first, yeah, I don't think Backstabber was on Infinite. I was think it? it may have been. But yeah, that version... Yeah. That was the first song we ever did. And my first thing was... My first mind was like, yo... I knew what he was saying. I could hear how he was connecting everything. Then I had never really heard nobody like connect like that besides Tretch. And he was doing it better than Tretch was at the time to me. And I was like, this is incredible. This is what I want to do. And mind you, I'm only doing beats three months. Yeah. Backstabbers on infinite. Yeah. I was so, right. So, so at this point he sparks. Now I'm like, yo, we got it. Let's just keep going. Okay. And where yeah. are you guys recording at this point? We were recording everywhere from Mo Master Studios, which is a very, very popular studio in that time. Right. Mo Master, you would pay by the hour to record pay there, by right? by the hour. Right. So we had to have a song together, work on it, all of that. And then where else were we recording? Oh, Dia Day Studios. Remember Dia Days? Mm -hmm. And then we start recording at Mark and Jeff Bass spot on 8 Mile. And that's when we You recorded. guys were really in the thick of making Infinite. We was making Infinite at this point. And did that project start with an intent of making an album called Infinite? Or was it like you started working with them and just kept working with them and it evolved into a project? I think Infinite, by the time we got to that song, I might even gave him, I might even gave him that beat, you know, the, the maybe I gave him that beat first or it was the like beat the for first Infinite, or the song? Yeah. And I remember, like, we gravitated towards that one so much. And and I don't know. Mind you, you can tell the influence. My influence was from Tribe. So it was kind of like we were trying to, you know, AZ and Nas was it at the time. Yeah, they were, they were like the really popular rappers. And you can yeah. hear a lot of that influence in the way Marshall rapped on that project, for sure. Yeah. So we were trying to, we were just trying to get a song on, on 98. That was the goal. <laughs> So the local radio station, WJLB, yeah. which was the, the urban FM station, you guys thought that maybe you could make something to make it on the air there. We just wanted to make it on the air. We, we, we went so far as doing commercials. Bushman got like two or three commercials out of us. We was just happy to be on, on, the, on the show. Like, remember, he sure. would play the little songs before he'd start his show. And we had this one song, Bushman's back in the mix again. Bushman's back in the mix from six to ten. And it was like even doing that. Right. <laughs> just like, hearing yourself on the radio was like a just huge was deal. Amazing. Right. But and, what you yeah. guys didn't realize, and, and it becomes more and more so over the years, is that this is corporate radio. Yeah. Right. So and we don't understand the workings of no, it. No, you're we're like, kids and we're like, well, why well, how no. come they don't play more Detroit rap on the radio station here? Yeah. And we don't really understand the way that radio worked back then. Exactly. Even more exactly. so probably than now, but 
it's complicated. Yeah, they even have more control back then than they do now because then they yeah. could pick some stuff yeah. that they could play. Yep. Now the the even a lot of the mix shows they're told, okay, this here's a list of records that you you can play. They end up playing some of the songs. So JLB played some of the stuff from Infinite, and Infinite was released independently. You mm-hmm. produced how many of the records on that album? All of them except for Jealousy. So that's twelve records, eleven records. Yeah, this is you me, produced three ten, in. ten <laughs> out of the eleven records. Yeah, I mean, that's great. That's like starting off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's just that's your first project that you ever locked into, right? Man, first time, and that was like my guy. Like I'm like, this was it. This is like I felt like I belonged in a place. Because, right. you know, before then, you know, you would go through crews, you would have your crews. But at that time, the guys, you know, man, like it was very hard to get people to stay serious about it. You know, you got to spend all your money to the studio. Yeah. Well, not only do you have to you spend know? your money, but there was no money coming in. Yeah. So unless you really, really wanted to do it. Yeah. You had to give it to it. Yeah. You, why else would you do it? Yep. But, but let's make something clear. Not only was there not money coming in, you're spending your own money to make the records and to get studio time, mm-hmm. but you guys are working also. Right? Yeah, very, very much so. <laughs> so let's talk about that for a second, yeah. because there's some legendary stories about oh, that, yeah. those times. Where were you guys working? Uh, Gilbert's. Gilbert's Lodge in St. Clair Shore. But before that, there was something else, right? Well, they worked at Little Caesars. Okay. Him and Proof but worked at Little Caesars. You didn't work Little at Little Caesars. Caesars? No, I didn't work at Little Caesars. Okay, so so Proof and Marshall worked at Little Caesars, mm-hmm. making pizzas yep. or pizza pizzas yep, and crazy bread. It, man. <laughs> hot and ready, and, baby. Hot yeah. and ready. Well, they weren't hot and ready back <laughs> they, then. But, they weren't but hot and ready then. It was the pizza pizza. It came in like, it was on the cardboard and it had the paper sleeve that was like stapled shut, right? And it, and it, and it tastes like paper, but that's all we had. No, it, it was good, man. I, lo- I yeah. loved it. I mean, so, <laughs> so, so you move over to Gilbert's, yeah, right, and still making pizza, mm-hmm. pretty much. But what were you guys doing there? Marshall was a short order cook, right? Yeah, he was the, but he was the main cook. I was running, I was running the fryer, the the yeah, the fryers. So I was dropping mot sticks hot left and right, like mozzarella sticks and. Fried mushrooms and all of that stuff. French fries and yeah, I was whatever was fried chicken wings. Yep, pretty much. Got so you. then I would do. Sometimes I would run. I would be like secondhand, but man, he was quick. So I was like, let me get back on this fryer, and because <laughs> you know it's like he moving, moving, moving. You know when he do something, he locked into it. So you could tell at that point he, his OCD was like really kicking in. And did you guys intend to work there together? Was that like a thought? No, I think, you know, I needed a job because I wasn't, I was staying with my parents. But at this point, I know that this is what I want to do. So I'm focusing a lot on music. My dad really didn't want me to get into music. And we, we weren't seeing eye to eye at that time. And then um, M was like, yo, I can get you a job here. And I was like, cool. So were you guys both still living at home at this point? No, I was living, we were living uh, on Navarra. We lived in Detroit on Navarra, not far from Eastland. That's on the east side of Detroit. So you guys had a house together. Yeah, me, him, and James, you, him, and, and, a, and a few other guys, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And he's working at Gilbert's. Mm hmm. Living in a house with Marshall. Yep. And here's the crazy part about that. Let me make this point. Let me I'm tell you. I'm not going to get I, into the Taurus. Yeah, no, 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 no. The, the, let me tell you, this is the most important, one of the most important things. I knew he was a lot more like me the way that he handled that. I didn't. He didn't have money to give me for beats. I couldn't stay in my house if I didn't have a job. So he was like, yo, you don't really got a place to stay. I'll give you the room. I'm going to sleep on the couch. Whoa. So he gave up his room so that you could focus on being an artist and then helped you get a job at Gilbert's Yep, so that you can make ends meet. He knew I was good enough to like, you know, it was like, we had a, we had a connection at this point. Like we, we had a, we had a, a a synergy like that, that worked. And I was like, all right, look, I'm going to get better at beats. I'm uh, and I needed a place to make beats. I was making beats in the room at the crib and he gave me the room. Wow. 
and he slept on the couch. And I was like, you know what? There's no way that I'm ever, this became like my closest friend. Yeah, well, listen, if that's not the definition of a friend, I don't know what is. Yeah. And so at that point, I knew it was somebody that had the same passion for it and everything. And I learned so much because he even taught me, he taught me how to be a better rapper too. So, And she, I, I taught him stuff about beats while we was there. So he had an understanding even before he met Dre of how to actually put it together. He knew what he wanted to hear. You know? Wow. So, That's deep. Uh, so yeah. at what point do you guys start to realize maybe this is going to actually work because infinite comes out. Yeah. Like you said, it got a little bit of like attention maybe from local radio, but nothing serious. Yeah. It's really sold very independently to the point where now this is where I come into the picture. Mm-hmm. Marshall, I had introduced, been introduced to Marshall through proof, right? Mm-hmm. Proof was managing the hip hop shop. Mm-hmm. I was in law school yep. at university of Detroit And every Saturday would be open mic at the hip hop shop. Yeah. And I always had a dream that when I became a lawyer and started practicing music law, I was going to grab a bunch of my favorite rappers and producers from Detroit Mm -hmm. and represent them as their lawyer. Right. That was my, my idea. That's what I thought I was going to do. Yeah. So I would go to the hip hop shop as a fan, but also to see what was developing within the scene. Mm -hmm. So one day proof pulls me aside and he says, Hey, I want you to stay after the battles are done today. And I want, I got somebody I want you to meet. And I said, all right, you know, proof was always up to something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who is it? And he just gives me this look and he's like, it's a white boy. (laughs) <laughs> right so so i was like oh okay you want the white guy to see the white guy rap all right fine yeah. i'll stay so i stay after and this guy walks in with you know really short shaved head not mm-hmm. bald like mine but you know a number one clipper yeah, number one boy yeah <laughs> wearing a uh, white sweatsuit head to toe mm-hmm. looking a little bummy mm-hmm and Proof cleared everybody out except me and, like, DJ Head and a couple other people. Mm-hmm. And he had him rap. So that's how I met Marshall. And two weeks later, or three weeks later, something like that, I'm at the shop again, and Marshall pops in again, maybe wearing the same sweatsuit. Mm-hmm. And Probably. he's selling Infinite hand-to-hand. I was there that day. On cassette. Yep. And I bought it from him for six dollars. Yes. And that that was the beginning of it. Right. So I don't know if you remember the first time I met you. I I don't. But tell me. It was that maybe I will. At St. Andrews. Okay. You had a girl with you. Uh Oh, yep. She has short hair. Okay. I remember this chick and I was like, yo, this dude like. He like the thing, cause like he got this badass chick with him. He's like, come in, he was lawyer. And so everybody like was excited. And then, and then let me tell you how much of a kid I am. I'm like, everybody excited to meet you. And they I see you, cause they know you. And I'm like, yo. And I like put my hands out and I hug you and I hit the girl. You hit her? Like, yes. Joking like around. My, my hand hit her. You don't oh, even remember. By accident. <laughs> yeah, by accident. I know, I, like, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, and this was at St. Andrews. And I was like, but I had heard about you already because you had already met him. So I was, I looked like I was a baller? You like, you was balling. Yes. Because you liked the lawyer. All yes. I knew was lawyer, bro. Yeah, okay. <laughs> had, I, had I known, but then they told me you rapped and all that stuff. I was like, what? I had, I had used to yeah, rap. I used <laughs> like, to rap. Yeah. No, lawyers, lawyers can't rap. It, yeah, it, it, like, turns out, it turns out they can't. <laughs> And I was like, okay, wait a minute. No, no, that's, you know, that's downplaying because y'all, you know, you can rap. You just, so I met you, know. so I met you with, with my current situation and yep. you introduced yourself. I introduced myself like I knew you. And, and how, how much prior to that was when I saw you again and bought the cassette from Marshall? Within a few <sighs> months or? That was, it was not that long after. It right. was not that long after, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's funny. Yeah. All right. So then what we all know 
or should know, and anybody's listened this far probably knows, mm-hmm. is it's not like the Infinite album blew up. No. Right? It was definitely, it was one of those things where people in the hood knew about it, and they was like, yo, this white boy is ill. It was so his people, first swing at the plate. That's it. Yep. So I moved to New York after that because I graduated law school in 96. Yeah. And Infinite had come out in 95, right? It came out at the end of 95, 96 because I right. remember saying that. Yeah, yeah I think I bought it, it at the end of 95. Yep. And then 96, I graduated law school, moved to New York, take the bar. Mm-hmm. But I stayed in touch with everybody from from Detroit. Yeah. So then you guys continue working together. Mm-hmm. And where do you, wh- wh- where does, where do things go? Tell me your recollection. Well, we ended up trying to push that as much as we could. We went to Freaknik. We went to, we drove to Freaknik. And so you guys drove down to Freaknik to pass out tapes. Pass out. But was that infinite? That was infinite. Okay. And we was pushing that for a while, and then M just got frustrated. And I want to say, Haley, no, it was Lena was born. And I remember him just being, because because right after Lena was born, Haley, he got Kim got pregnant with Haley. Yeah. And he was like, so Yo. his back was against the wall. Yeah, it was like that's when it got real. And we moved from um, Fairport is not far from Navarre. It's a city, it's a little it's a street in Detroit that's close. To, it's right off Seven Mile, literally still smashing. So you guys hood. moved into the next house with each other. We moved into the next house. And now he's he's a dad. Right. So it's like. So, so stuff is getting very real. It's real, real. And, and he's feeling his back's against the wall. Yeah, and like I'm, I'm like, come on, I'm, I'm staying at this place with him, and Kim, and they like, look, I'm like the the extra guy at the place. I'm not paying anything. I'm just making beats. And Kim, uncle, your like, uncle Nani. Yeah, and I'm like sitting there. <laughs> Kim probably was like, he got to get out of here. I'm like, I'm a, you know, it's right. nothing. But we, but at this point, he we start dabbling in more of. He start growing into Slim Shady. 